And Jesus said the following, and they said to him, but your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside. I mean, they were so rude that they came to interrupt him while he was preaching. And they came and they said, can you come? And he said, who is my mother and my father and my brother and my sisters? Those that do the will of my father. So, so Jesus even made a very strong statement at that moment where he said, they are not doing God's will. Now, now, now in our modern day, we're going to say he judged them. No, he didn't. Because he knew where the presence of God is. This morning, I want to challenge you in this time that your love for Jesus and your pursuit for Jesus, let it be stronger, stronger than anything, stronger than your family, stronger than if we, ek weet wat mense kom sê vir my, ja, maar dis te, te veel kerk, te, te, wie jy, dan wil ek so my, ah. Because how in your world, your life, if, if Jesus is the very one that saved you, the one that hung on the cross in your stead, the one that paid the price that you should have paid, now we say this stuff. Jesus, then, then Jesus loved you too much. <laughs> That's a shock. He loved me too much. If it is too much for me to be committed to him, if it's too much for me to be committed to his church. And listen, many times people say to me, yeah, but I'm serving Jesus. I don't have to be in the church. You know, when I saw my wife, I looked at her and I looked at her face, but I looked at the rest of the body as well. I don't know about you. Maybe you are so holy that you just looked at the face. Not me. I wanted to see that everything is good. And when I married my wife and I love her, I tell her, you're looking good. You are beautiful. And I'm not just referring to the eyes. I'm referring to the whole body. Imagine I tell my wife, you know, I love you, but I'm not interested in your body. What's she going to do? She's not going to love me back. She's not going to be happy with the fact that I say, I don't love your body, but I love you. I said, believe it. You love the whole thing. I mean, imagine young girl, you, you, a, a boy comes and tells you, I like your hair and I like your eyes and I like your face, but your body sucks. What are you going to do? You're going to be offended with him. Now, why do we do this to Jesus? I love your church, but I don't like, I, I love you, but I don't like your church. I like you, Jesus. I'll follow you. I'll listen to what you say, but the church, leave the church outside. I don't want to part of, I don't want to be, I don't like the church. It's like loving your wife without the body. So why do we want to serve a decapitated Christ? Because the body is everything. The body is God on earth, us. The person next to you carries Jesus, which means whatever you do to that person, you are doing to Jesus. So if I don't like your hair and I judge you about your hair because I don't like your hair, what am I saying? That this temple of God is not good enough. Jesus, I only like you when you fit that, that, that personality. Jesus, I only love you when you look like that. Jesus, I only love you when you are that color, when you are that culture. Jesus, I only love you. No, Jesus said what you have done to the least of my brethren, you have done unto me. We, we have to understand that we are gathered in a family, and yes, the family will irritate you sometimes. I mean, even Jesus' family irritated him. Even they did. So, so, but we want to be so spiritual that we lose our brains when it comes to the love that we have to have for one another. So, I want to challenge you this morning. When you say a living sacrifice, do, do we even get it, understand what we're saying? I present myself as a living sacrifice, holy unto you, O God. Not I present myself when I want to. I present myself when the song is right. I present myself when the church does the way I want the church to be. No, 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 no. Lord, it's not what I want. It's what you want. So I can say, well, I can't sing because I'm false. The Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So if you make a noise when you sing, sing. Because it's a sacrifice. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's something you do beyond your comfort. It's something you do that will sacrifice something, your comfort. It will sacrifice your dignity. It will sacrifice your 
pride. It will sacrifice somewhere. Okay, and family, I'm not a doom preacher at all. You know me. But the thing is this. The light and the darkness is separated so much now, and it is being separated even much more. In this world, right and wrong get separated so big now. There's no more gray areas. It's either this or it's that. And it's just going to get stronger like that, which makes it easier. Okay, easier to spot those that really love God and to spot those that love the world. And it's sad to see how many people that are in the house of God loves the world more. And it's no judgment. It's just a wake-up call. Hello. What do you love more? Because if you love something else more, you can't follow. What is it? What is it that you love so much that you can't follow? Or what is it that you dislike so much about following that you just stop following? When we present ourselves a living sacrifice, it is, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Not what I want. Not what I want. And, and, and I'm very strong on this dude, this morning because, you know, it, it happens so much in our society now that everything is dressed to suit you. What you want, we will supply it at a price. But when it comes to God, it is, I will give you what I know is best for you, but it will cost you as well. And that's why we don't like it, because we want to pay for what we want. We don't want to pay for what He wants. <laughs> so this morning, just for a moment, just lift your hands. It's you before Jesus. And whatever it is that you've made more important than Him, you've got to choose today. And say, Lord, I love my sin more than you. Or you say, Lord, I can't carry on like this. I know I need to surrender completely. So just for a moment, just for a moment, softly in the background, my life is a living sacrifice. Jesus, come on, this is your time with Jesus. Speak to him, speak to him, speak to him, speak to him. What is it that you have made more important? This is like a pause, a pause. A pause before you run to the rest of the, the end of the year. A pause. What is more important? Okay, just get the right just get the right note there, please, because that ain't working. Just worship. Just for a moment. This is between you and Jesus. The band will sort themselves out. I will be a yes. living sacrifice. Now speak to him. Speak to him. All my heart and soul to glorify. I offer nothing less than all my life for Jesus. Come on, this is like a reset button. Once more, and then we get into the word. I will be a living sacrifice. Oh, my heart and soul to glorify. I offer nothing less than all my life for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I can see how people are realigned. It's amazing because I see you from this side in the eyes of the Holy Spirit and I can see how God realigns people. People's hearts are realigned. It's just amazing. Now listen, make up your mind. Be like concrete, thoroughly mixed and set in your decision. Don't go now back and go be that other person again. All right, this is why we gather together because Jesus comes and he puts his finger on something and he says, do you really love me? I don't want to be like the Ephesian church. The Ephesian church is one of the most amazing books when you read it and how amazing they were, how they loved God. And then you go into the book of Revelations and then he says, one thing I got against you, Ephesians, that your love for me has grown cold. I mean, that's shocking. It was the model church, but their love grew cold. 
Don't let your love for Jesus grow cold because of everything that you go through. Let your love for Jesus be everything. Okay? And that is manifested towards your love for your neighbor and people around you. Amen? Amen. All right, you can take your seat this morning. Give somebody a Bluetooth high five. Say hello. <laughs> We're your family. Amen. So good morning to everybody that's online with us on behalf of Pastor At and Nareta Bosov. Welcome to CRC Uppington, the best place to be in town. And I would like to welcome all the first-time visitors, many first-time visitors with us this morning. Thank you for being with us. Maybe different, but it does, different doesn't mean it's wrong. Okay, so we are a lively bunch. We like life. Amen. So welcome this morning. And then also Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Please never, ever, 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 ever replace online church for attending church. Okay, it's like you have a family meeting and you do it on Zoom. Mm. Family lunch. Those in Australia, those in Canada, they make their food and you all sit around the TV screen and you're having lunch together. Nobody likes that. I mean, God doesn't want that either. He wants us all gathered as a family together around the table and eat together. Amen. It's much better to feel people than just to watch them on a screen. Amen. So I know some of you are far, but... If you can make it here, get here, in Jesus' name. So welcome to Achenais, Kakamas, Priska, Rietfontein, Springbok, all of you, all of the home cells there, doing great things, loving Jesus, staying committed, so we love you. And then also to the Correctional Services, Uppington, wonderful to be with you again today. I know God has a great plan for your life, just don't give up on Him, in Jesus' name. And then, great, great news, our Harvest 2022 on the 9th of November. Okay, so everything we do is going towards Harvest 2022 with Pastor At. Amen. So uh, this week we will start to, to, to register people because we have to register people. We will send out register cards and everything in the app and we'll set it all up and then it will be ready this week so that you can invite all your friends. So then you don't just tell them to come, but you get them to make a commitment, to say, okay, I'll be there. I'll commit to be there. I'm writing down my name. And then we can send messages to every single person. So it all will be according to the law, and everybody can get their messages, and everybody can be touched, okay? So that we can have great, 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 great results. Amen. What an amazing harvest we had in CRC Nelspreit. It was such a... A privilege to go serve Pastor Henny because that's what I went to do is to go serve my brother um, because none of us are greater than any other so we can also serve and I went to serve my brother it was great I've learned so much and I came back and I'm excited we've, we've adopted a lot of things that they are doing on that side because this is our first harvest and we're gonna see great things happen I mean over four and a half thousand people gathered together of which 1,400 people gave their lives to Jesus now, I mean, what is more important than that? Souls, souls, souls. So, with all of that in mind, I want to start a series called Prepare for the Harvest. Okay? And it's not just preparing for our harvest, but it's preparing for the harvest that God has in your life. We have declared that this is the year of many, many breakthroughs. Now, I know many of us have seen great breakthroughs. Some of us are still holding on for our breakthroughs, okay? I mean, it's amazing. I talk to people and I see sometimes they are sad and they're grumpy and I ask them, didn't God do something for you this year? I see you driving a new car and I see God has promoted you and all of that. But then we still complain about the petrol price and ESCOM and everything. Now, I understand these are challenges, but just look back at the year and ask yourself, isn't things better than what it was in 2020? Isn't it better than what it was in 2021? Isn't things getting better? Did some things change in your life? I, I see people buying new cars every day now. Everywhere I go, new cars, new cars, new cars. It's maybe because I got a new car. Now I see everybody having new cars. <laughs> but it's a blessing. It's amazing. Then you see, wow, this is a year of many breakthroughs. Because God is blessing people personally. And if you're still waiting for your breakthrough, hey, this is your sermon. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because something is coming. 
Say, Pastor, how can you say that? Because the Bible says so. Amen. God is not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of principle, yes, but not of persons. He doesn't love me more than he loves you. I'm not his blue-eyed boy, even if I do have blue eyes. I mean, I am his son like you are his son and you are his daughter. And he loves you equal. But God loves principles. If you follow his principles, then he honors principle. Okay? So if you do what he asks you, obedience, then you will walk and you will have the good of the land. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19 that says, If you are willing and obedient, two things, willing and obedient. Are you willing? Are you obedient? Because if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. You shall eat the good of the land. I mean, we live in South Africa and we complain about what we have and we want to go to maybe greener pastures. Many of us planning on leaving, leaving to a place that we think is better. Okay, somebody once asked me, they said, so if you can live in any other place in the world, where would it be? Because I've been to 48 nations in the world. So I, I've got my favorite places. And I said, if I ever have to leave South Africa, I'm moving to Brazil. So now, now it's like, not Australia, not Canada, not Europe. No, why there? Because it's the closest to here. They have the closest of what we've got. Yeah. And I said, but why do you want to do that? Don't you, don't you think there are better places? And they said, so, so what would you say? Where is the best nation to live? And I said, yeah. Why? Because I've seen what is on the other side. Like many of your relatives that went there and now they live there, they're miserable, but they always tell you, no, it's better than here. They're lying. It's just because they don't want to admit they made a mistake. <laughs> because it's amazing how when you go there, you tell everybody how great South Africa is. And then when you get back here, you tell everybody how great that place is. That's, that's our human nature. If somebody goes somewhere, they come back and they tell you everything about that country. Oh, it's so amazing and it's beautiful and this. Okay, but let's get the complete picture. And, and, and this person asked me, where would you go? I said, I would stay here. Why? Because I would rather face the devil that I know than going to another place and discover a new devil that I don't know how to handle. That's it. So I love our country, and, and, and I believe we are here for a purpose. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. So, so if you don't have a divine word from God, uh, listen to what I'm saying. A divine word from God, don't leave, because it's not going to end up well. No, it's still. Well, I just said it. You have to have a calling. You have to have a word to go somewhere to be successful there. Because if you are not called by God, you're not going to survive walking on the water. Amen. And I don't care what the politicians say. I don't care if people say, well, white people shouldn't be in South Africa because they're Europeans. I guess yammer. I was born here. My mother was born here. My grandmother was born here. My great-grandmother was born here. And her, her mother and her mother and her mother. So you're really going to have to get a lot of Africa out of me before you get me out of Africa. And it ain't going to happen. So please, we have to unite and work this nation together. And stop complaining and start to look for results and start to speak life in every difficult situation. I know it's frustrating. I also get frustrated. Okay, but it's, it's not worth it to, to throw in the towel and leave because that's not going to help anybody in any case. Okay, life is great when you have challenges. Life is boring if there's no challenges. Amen. I thought I'm just going to get three amens there. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 says, And I hear the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? I mean, this is God's voice echo echoing through every single generation. Who can I use? Who is willing? If I am willing and I'm obedient, I will eat the good of the land. And God's eyes are going to and through the earth, seeking whom he may show himself strong on their behalf. If I can stand like Isaiah did and say exactly what he said, yeah, here I am, Lord, send me. It's not about being qualified, it's about being available. God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. 
you first know that God has called you. God gave you a purpose. God has called you. And then because he called you, he will qualify you. Hmm? Well, God, I can't. I also said it. I used to stutter and I couldn't speak. And I actually quoted um, Jeremiah where the Lord said, go, go, be my, my, my prophet. And I would say exactly what he said. Lord, I can't speak. I'm still a young boy. I can't speak. And the Lord said, I will put my word in your mouth. And where you go, I will be. And what I tell you to say, say it. And that's been my life up until now. To go and to speak what God says. What he places on my heart and he says, tell my people, go. Then you go. You don't use your excuses. Well, I can't speak. Well, I'm too white. Well, I'm too black. Well, I, whatever. No, you are the person that God has called. God has placed you where you are because he has a plan for you and the people around you. And it doesn't matter if you are like Joseph going through the pit and the palace and the prison and everywhere, but you will end up as prime minister where God wants you. So don't quit on the journey because the journey might take you some places that you never imagined through your business, through everything. Sometimes great, sometimes bad. But that's life. Ultimately, when you're at the end of your life, you can look back. I listened to a, a businessman that's, that, that told his story just this last week. And I mean, he told his story. Everybody said to me, why did you have to ask him now? Because he was speaking for two and a half hours straight. I said, it's okay, because some of us as young people don't want to sit and listen to the previous generation. And we know that old women can sit and talk forever and get boring. Okay, but it's okay. Sometimes you just have to sit, shut up and listen. And listen what he says. Listen to his wisdom. Listen to his experience. And listening to the whole thread of salvation through his, his old life. Because that is what salvation is. It's a thread right through your life. It's not just one moment. It is a continuous. It starts and then it continues and continues and continues. It's a thread through your life, salvation. Those who endure to the end shall be saved. It's a thread, okay? Because you're not always perfect, even if you act like it. I mean, some Christians, when I talk to them, I think, you, I wish I was that perfect. And people look at you sometimes and they think you're perfect. I ain't perfect, man. But then they expect you to be perfect because, you know, say you're a Christian and you act as if you are all perfect. You ain't perfect. You're making mistakes. And that's where the grace and the love of Jesus comes in. Now, it doesn't give you an excuse to make mistakes. No, we all want to be like him. We all want to be like him. We all want to follow him. And when we want to be like him, that means there are going to have to be many occasions where God is going to have to save you. Save you from yourself. Save you from an impulsive decision. Save you from stupidity. Save you from making a mistake. Because <laughs> if you're perfect, you would have been in heaven already. Yes. So, so, so we keep on looking at other people's mistakes and our own mistakes, and then we keep on disqualifying ourselves. And God doesn't disqualify you. He enables you. His strength is made, work, made, made strong in your weakness. He's made perfect in your weakness. God made perfect in your weakness. Where you miss it, He completes it. But without Him, you can't. That's it. So John chapter 4, verse 35 to 38. Listen. Do you not say there is still four months and then comes the harvest? Now, Many of us see this harvest event and we're like, okay, it's only November the 9th. No, it's here now. <laughs> you better prepare now. You can't wait for then. It's too late. Okay? It's now. It's not then. It's now. Okay? Then we celebrate. But now we work. Amen? So he says, do you not say it's still four months and then come the harvest? Behold, I say, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are ready. They are already white for harvest. They are already ready. So Jesus says, you better change your perspective. You can't wait for something to happen. You've got to create it now. You've got to start now. Open up your eyes. See, because before you wipe your eyes, the harvest is already rotten on the field. So don't say, well, one day when I grow old, 
Listen, listen. I just discovered this recently again. Everybody always told me, well, when you get to 40, then you're at the right age. 40, 40, that's the age. Go, go, go. Okay? And then I thought, okay, when 40 comes. Guess what I discovered when I was 40? Everybody told me, you should have done it because you're too old now. So don't wait for one day. One day, one day, when one day comes, it's too late. One day is now. Lift up your eyes. Not me, I can also be hung to be like 20 years. When you wipe your eyes, you are 40. And you should have done something already. Okay, so, so don't hang. Don't hang. Move. Move. Be a mover, be a shaker. When people say you can't do it in your 20s, then show them you can do it in your 20s. Hmm? Hey. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. See the fields. They are already white unto harvest. And he who reaps, listen, he who reaps receives wages. He who reaps receives wages. Those who minister the gospel will live of the gospel. And they receive double honor. How much do you think your pastor is, 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 is worth? Now I'm asking this question. How much do you think I'm worth? Because the Bible says I'm double what you think. <laughs> Who is arrogant? Yeah, it's Bible. The Bible says you are worthy double. Double honor. Double honor. Mm -hmm. Some of us think, yeah, my pastor is so useless to spit. Rarig? Oeh, dit raak ongemakkelijk in die plek. Sjoe, ek voel het. Those who reap the harvest receives wages. Those who do not re re reap the harvest doesn't receive wages. People ask me, how do you grow the church? Easy. Salvations. Reap the harvest. Reap the harvest. Just reap the harvest. Go and get people saved. It's that simple. Then everything grows. Everything grows. Yeah, that must be the secret. Yeah, the secret is salvation. Salvation and discipleship. That's the secret. If you don't do those two, if you don't get people saved and you don't disciple people, and nothing growing. Nothing is growing. Nothing. Your business. If you don't recruit and train up, your business ain't growing. It's just going to be the two of you. You and the secretary for the rest of your life. It's not going to happen. Nothing's growing. You better recruit some people, find some people and train them up. Disciple them. Same thing with the church. You have to get people saved. You have to disciple them. Then the church grows. Amen. You see, people don't want the hard work aspect. They just want the grace. The Lord must drop it out of heaven and it falls in my lap and now I'm blessed. No, that's not blessing. Blessing is the wages of hard work. You do your part, God does his part. You do what is humanly possible, God will do the impossible. You do your part, God will do his part. Because it's a partnership, it's a covenant. It's not all me or all him. No, it is us together. Your business belongs to God. Don't say God is your partner, but he can't make the decisions. When last did you go to God and say, Lord, do you really want me to spend it on this? Do you really want us to do this? Not God is my partner, but I make all the decisions. No, then he's a silent partner. He gives you the money, he gives you the blessing, and you do it all. And he can't keep you accountable because you're silent. <laughs> now listen, he says, For he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. Now that's the most powerful statement in the Bible. Because he who reaps gets wages, you get paid for what you do, but you gather riches of eternal value. Eternal value. You know, I might not be a millionaire in rent, but I'm definitely a billionaire in souls. Because I made up my mind. I made up my mind. When I get to heaven, there will be a reward. And the reward will be those that got saved. What does it help you if the world knows your name but God doesn't? What does it help you if Hollywood knows exactly who you are? Now, what does it help you if the whole world knows that you're the richest man in the world but heaven doesn't know you? Because you haven't done anything for the kingdom of heaven. 
What does it help you? Temporary value, eternal loss. No, we live for eternal value, eternal value. And eternal value is God's love for people. Hallelujah. He says, he who reaps, receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reap may rejoice together. Now listen, because this is what I want to say. People have sowed and we come to reap. Listen, he says the following. For in this, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. This thing is going to become a reality in the next few weeks. I sent you to reap for what you have not labored. I sent you to reap for what you have not labored. I sent you to get somebody else's harvest. We are living in that time, family. We could have lived in the time of the early disciples where they didn't see the fruit of all their sacrifice. I mean, those people's churches wasn't that big. It was a sacrifice in the beginning, and then it became bigger and bigger and bigger. When the church started, it was started big. But when the people were scattered, they were all by themselves, and they had to rally together, and they had to communicate without having emails and without having WhatsApp and without having international dialing codes. They had to connect with one another. They had to pursue one another. It was a lonely road there. Now we have all the strength of all the technology and everything. We can reap this world in one day if we are focused. If we understand the call. Hmm? He says, one sows and the other reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. This is a word of God for Uppington CRC for this harvest. Listen to me. Listen to me. I, I said it on Friday night with half night prayer. So we better pray this now with breath prayers and centering prayers. What has God given us? God has given us the harvest that others labored for. God has given us the harvest that others labored for. The, the revelation will come. Repetition. He says, and you have entered into their labor. You have entered into their labor. You know, when I came to Uppington the first time here, it was actually amazing. I, I moved here. Um, I had to walk the streets and I had to knock on doors and I had to find people that would love to come to church with me because I didn't know anybody yet. Okay, so I was there in Bain Street and I started knocking on doors. I told you the story. Door number eight, a lady opened up and the name was Lida and Lida invited me in and we started with home cell. That was the first home cell. Me and Lida. And then Lida's daughter came and then another girl that is still in town that God is blessing. And then um, it was the, the, the four of us. Us four and no more for quite some time and then we were preaching and we were having home cell every Tuesday I would drive from Groedrink to Uppington to come and have home cell and then I moved to Uppington and I stayed in a small house in uh, what is the street? I was going to forget um, I moved there there were all the rich people it's so funny I lived in this house where all the rich people stay but I was so poor I just had one mattress one uh, uh, cup and one plate and one knife and one fork and one spoon. That's what I had. 25 plastic chairs that I borrowed from another church. And I started church with three people. <laughs> That's how I started. Okay, but purpose, purpose, listen, listen. So what happens? I entered into a harvest, a harvest, because I won't forget it. Within the first month, this older gentleman and lady, they called me out of nowhere. They said, are you the pastor of CRC? I said, yes, I am. I, I hope to be. And they said, well, we need to see you. So I drove to their place. They were living in this old little house. You can see, struggling. And they said to me the following. They said, a month ago, God sent you to Uppington. We have been praying for you for the last eight years. Yeah, because we knew that this church needs to come to this town. Eight years prayer before I came. Yes, they labored in prayer. And then I walked in there and they said, so God has sent us now to Springbok, so it's up to you now to make the success. I said, so you've prepared the way. They said, yes. 
We've prayed for eight years for you to come. You are here now. We are leaving. And then they went. That was it. One meeting, one boom, there they go. And the Lord said, I prepare a way for you. And now you are entering somebody else's labor. You know, one of the most amazing stories for me for, of, of evangelist Reinhard Bonke was when he went to Malawi. So doing crusades, crusades, for the first nine years, seven to nine years of his life, he never saw one person saved as an evangelist. Yes, for the first, I think it was six years. Six years of his life, it might be longer, I'll correct myself. So for six years, preaching the gospel in Lesotho, he doesn't get one person saved. There you go, evangelist. And then God spoke to him. And God said, I see a blood-washed Africa. Then he got the tent and, the, the, and then things happened. People got saved. People, it was rallied. It got bigger, bigger, bigger. And then when he went to Zimbabwe, his whole tent blew away. First in Cape Town and then in Zimbabwe. And then the Lord said, the canopy of the stars will be your, will be your canopy of your tent. So you do it outside. So he started going outside. He walked into, um, so he did South Africa, he did Zimbabwe, he did... Zambia, all these, and it was smaller crusades. Crusades of, when I say smaller, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 people. Then he went into Blantyre, Malawi, and he, he did his first crusade there. The first night, 800,000 people showed up. So he stood there in shock with all the people that are there, and the Lord said, you are entering other people's, you are la enter other people's labor. Uh, he didn't understood. And the first night when he wanted to preach, one of the pastors came up and he opened up a book and he welcomed Evangelist Bonka and he said to him the following, he said, can I, can I just read something? I've got a letter here that was written by um, uh, uh, Livingston, David Livingston. And he says, can I read it? And Bonka says, yes, you're welcome, read it. And he started reading and he said, where we have traveled and where we have spent our lives, where we had blood, sweat, and tears, and we have seen no harvest, we haven't seen people saved. I prophesy that a hundred years from this day, somebody else will enter our harvest. They dated it, it was exactly a hundred years later. Yeah. Now listen. Yes, clap for the Lord if you want to clap. So, the lesson that we learn is that people labor, labor in prayer. People labor by laying down their lives. Don't think for one moment I walk into Uppington and I'm arrogant to think that I am now God's gift to the world. And I walk in here and I think, well, nobody did anything great in Uppington, so I'm coming here. Look at me. Never, never. The Lord said to me, you are entering other people's labor. People have sacrificed in this town. People have prayed in this town. People have pastors has laid down their lives. They have sacrificed their marriages. They have sacrificed so many things in this town. People. And the Lord said to me, you are entering their harvest. You are going to reap what they have, not, what they have labored for, what you have not labored for. This is the promise. People have laid down their lives. So don't think for one moment when we are going to have a fantastic harvest event, it's because of my personality of who I am. Nothing. It's because it's an instruction. You go and you go reap what others have sowed for. But you know what is sad? When we even miss our moment and God sent you to reap, but you look and you say, but it's not my harvest because I haven't planted it. You've got harvests waiting for you, but you can't recognize it because you don't realize that you are entering another person's harvest. There are businesses that exist today that you will own tomorrow. I'm saying this. Some of you will catch it. Some of you as business people. There are businesses that are owned today that it's been there for years and you will own tomorrow because you will enter into their labor. Don't think, well, I'm struggling with my business, well, I'm struggling, yeah. No, 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 there's a harvest. There's a harvest that somebody else paid for. There's a harvest that somebody else worked for. They did get their wages, but they did not get the harvest. There's a big difference. Oh, you've got to think a bit different when it comes to this. There are harvests waiting on people who are willing and obedient. There are harvests waiting on for people who are willing and obedient. But then you better put up your hand and say, Lord, here I am. Use me.
When I was in, in, in Hawaii, in Kona, Hawaii, and I was doing this Bible school there or there at the University of the Nations, YWAM, I was offered a job to stay there. I was offered a job to stay in Hawaii. Now imagine that. Vivo nani in Hawaii, Blaine. So I sat there and I was offered the job to be a lecturer at the university. And I sat there and the, <laughs> the dean looked at me and said, so will you come and work for us? I said, I can't. He says, why not? I said, because there's a calling. There's a calling to enter the labor of people in Uppington. He looked at me and said, listen, I've been in Uppington on my way through to Namibia. He says, if, 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 if that's the truth, then that can only be God. Because who in their right mind will live in Uppington when they have no guarantee of anything, no church, no nothing, nothing, and you leave a job opportunity in Hawaii? A beach bum preacher with a surfboard and long hair. I did have long hair at that stage. You know I me. Mean? <laughs> Imagine that. Hmm? But I understood something. You have to enter the labor of another. You have to enter. Listen, God is going to give you opportunities. Family, listen to me. Prepare yourself. That's why I'm saying prepare for the harvest. Because I first have to show you what's coming. I first have to talk to you about the breakthrough that's coming. I first have to talk to you about what you're going to get. Okay? And who paid for it. But then I need to get you to prepare yourself for it. Because if you're not prepared, you will not be able to handle it. So I never understood why I had to be in, in, next to this river for, for five years and not see results and pray. Because that was one of my prayers. I would preach every single day of my life with my bucky and my two speakers like these. Stand on the bucky, preach 20 children, and I would preach. I'm the great evangelist coming. Hallelujah. And I would preach to 20 people. 20 children every single day. Monday was um, a, a full graf sag. Tuesday was Grodring. Wednesday was top line. Thursday was um, wegdraai. And I would preach every single day. 20 people, 20 people, 20 people. The saved, same 20 get saved again and again and again and again. I mean. And then one day the Lord said, okay, I'm taking you to work for the crusades. And I said, Lord, please, I've labored. I haven't seen the harvest. And I prayed a prayer. And God took me serious on my prayer. I said, Lord, I need to come and reap that harvest. You know, in 2018, when I walked into Grodring, we had a thousand people at the crusade. <laughs> because I said, Jesus, please, I want to enter this labor again. Many people sacrifice and they are not even privileged to see their own labor. And to see the harvest of their labor. And I say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that I could enter into my own labor's harvest as well. But I want to tell you, many of you will enter into another person's labor. You will enter another person's labor. What they have worked, what they have suffered, what they have sacrificed in order to build. And you can just walk into it. You know, what? If one of the saddest things that I see is as I grow older, not that I'm old, but I've got some years. So I've watched and I see how people that used to be wombs and tannies for me are now passing on to be with the Lord. And I see how they have built their whole life, sacrificed to build a business, and then their children is not interested. Nobody else is interested, and they leave the farm, and they leave everything, and then there's a whole harvest that the next generation is not interested in. Because we have this mentality as slavery mentality that I didn't work for it, so I don't deserve it. Or I didn't work for it, I didn't want it. Listen. <laughs> Should I say this? What would you do for a million rand? Will you take over that business? Nee, pastoor, I just want a million rand. Make it easy. Because I want it for me so that I can do what I want to do. No, 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 no. Sometimes you're going to have to do something that you don't want to do in order to get that. And this is a word for somebody because you don't want to do that because you want the easy life. You don't want to do what your father did. You didn't want to do what your boss is doing. You just want the money that he has, but you don't want the effort that he puts in. 
And then God comes and he says, this whole business, this whole farm, this whole everything is your harvest, but you don't want it. Maybe you should renew your mind and say, hello, maybe I should enter the harvest of another man's labor. And his labor will produce for me. Go think about it. I'm, I'm, I'm triggering a lot of thoughts for a lot of people here today. The Holy Spirit told me to do so. Okay, so it's time to prepare for the harvest. How do I prepare for the harvest? Number one, it requires hard work. Okay, we are, we are closing into the time, nearing the time of harvest in Uppington. When we look at all these grape farms, I mean, what is your business's greatest time of expansion and greatest time of hard work? Is this time of harvest. Okay, you prepare for this harvest. Other people prepare to go on holiday in December, but you as a business person prepare for all the products that you're going to sell for this harvest. That farmer is preparing. What is he preparing? He's preparing the labor. He's sending buses to Mafi King, buses to Kuruman to go fetch laborers because the harvest is white, but the laborers are few. So he's sending out laborers to come, and then when the laborers come, they have to prepare. There is so much that goes into the infrastructure and into the investment of the farm before they get the fruit. Hard work, hard, hard, hard labor. You know, yesterday I was chopping wood for my wife, and I said to her, I'm never complaining about any person that asks an amount for a bag of wood. Because now you pay 30 rand or 40 rand or 50 rand for the wood and you complain. Ja, maar die hout te dier geword. Wanneer laas het jy hout gekap? <laughs> Suddenly, get a revelation. Gee, it takes hard work to chop that wood, man. Because you want the harvest with the fire and the heat. No, we want it easy. We want it easy. I just want to walk and eat the grapes, but I don't want to do the work. I just want the fruit. Give me the fruit. No, there is labor because he says you enter into somebody else's labor. They started it. You've got to finish it. It's not just you get the harvest. No, you enter their labor. Where they stopped, you have to start. They stopped here, you have to start because the stretch forward is much easier than the stretch they had. You remember that, that, that story that Jesus told about the people that came to work for him? The one started the morning and then or for the king and then the, the one started halfway through the day and then the other one ended up at the end guess what people we are the person that are being employed at the end and guess what we all get the same pay oh, we are living in the greatest generation ever we are living in the greatest generation ever because for one hour those, suffer, those people suffer nine hours in, 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 in their hard work. And then we complain if we have to suffer one hour in prayer. They prayed their whole life and they didn't see a result. We pray one hour. We have to pray for the next 90 days, less than yeah, 90 days, three months. We have to pray for three months and we complain. No, we are entering the harvest. We are entering the labor. So if we can pick up the labor quickly, we will not suffer that long. Because others have suffered their whole life. You can walk into that business and you can own the business in two years, which that man worked for for 40 years. But we don't want to enter the labor. We just want to have the reward. So I'm shifting our minds this morning and I'm going to do the same next week so that we prepare for what is coming. Okay, my time is up. But let me show you this quickly. Number one, hard work. Number two, continuous prayer. Number three, financial contribution. Okay, ask any farmer. You can have all the labor. You can have all the infrastructure. You can pray the whole day. But if you don't put some money into it, there ain't no harvest. And it's exactly the same with our harvest. Yeah, it's free to preach the gospel. Is it? No. Is it free to receive salvation? Yes. But does it cost to preach the gospel? Oh, you better believe it. 
You better believe it. You better believe it costs money to preach the gospel. Okay? So what changed your life, your job, your business, your school? All of that played a little role. But what changed your life? The day that you gave your life to Jesus, the gospel. So why do we invest in everything except the gospel? I spoke to five billionaires this week past. Five, I'm saying not millionaires, billionaires. 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 Nie miljoene nie, biljoene. Daar is een groot verskil. Die miljonair vertel vir jou, hy is een miljonair. Die biljoener is net jy. Hy sê niks. But when you talk to him, you are shaken when they talk the numbers. So I, 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 and they asked me, Pastor, what is the greatest investment? Billionaires. And thank God for a man like Reinhard Bonka that taught me. Because the greatest investment you can do is to change the morality of people. Because if you can change a person's morality, you can change the economy. What's our problem in South Africa? Morality. People don't care about people. They don't even, I mean, it costs you 500 rand to get somebody killed in Johannesburg. Did you know that? Hitman, 500 rand. 16-year-old boy, he kills somebody for you. 500 rand. That's the value of life in South Africa today. Now we look at that and we think, what's gone wrong? Well, then my question is, what's gone wrong with the harvest? Because we don't invest in reaping the harvest. Now we're sitting with prisons full of people that was a harvest that wasn't reaped. But the preacher have to suffer to preach. You keep him humble, we'll keep him poor. Listen, I've got respect for these people. Even if some of their gospels are not that pure, at least somebody is shouting from the morning till the evening, repent, 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 for the Lord is at hand. At least somebody's doing it, even if it irritates the hell out of us as Christians. It's okay. At least he's got the guts. At least somebody's doing it. At least, even if he doesn't get paid, he's still doing it. So, so the greatest investment that we can have is in, in, in harvest, in souls. Because if the morality of the people change, the economy of the city changes. We have seen in Africa how many people, then that whole city comes to the Lord and they all gather. You know that even to a place where we would do our gospel crusades, then, then we would go to a field and the people, listen, the people will shut their businesses and they would move their trolleys to the field. They would bring their business to the field and they would camp all around the field. And they would do business on the field where the gospel is being preached. Because that's the impact that the gospel made on the city. It shut every... They knew you're not going to make money in town. You better be at the harvest. Because those who reap the harvest will receive their wages. I pray that in South Africa we get to that place again. That the harvest is the most important. I mean... And I told the one guy, he said to me, so what is the budget for a harvest like this? Is it 4 million, 5 million? I said, no, it's actually like 600,000 to 1.2 million. He looked at me and he went pale. I said, why do you look like that? He says, well, I sp spent like three times that in a day. <laughs> I said, uh, and? He says, well, I'm embarrassed now. So, so hopefully some billionaire has been touched. But that doesn't mean, now listen, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, because now we can sit in our poverty mentality and say, ja, nee, die billionaire, beter maar bykie sy geld uithaal. En wat van jou? <laughs> wat van jou? You want to enter the harvest? You want to reap the harvest? What's your contribution? Where are you? You want breakthrough? Are you sowing for it? Are you trusting God for it? Or are you just waiting that something will fall, the pie out of the sky? Ain't going to happen. Amen? Okay, now I can continue like this forever, so I'm not going to. We're going to wrap it up for today, and then next week I'll pick up on that. Okay, because we have to be challenged in order to understand the benefit of something like this. This will change our city. It will change your business. It will change the church. It will change so many things in this community. 
But then we all have to understand that we all have a part to play. And this will enter you into another person's labor. And you will have the benefits of another person. Oh, come on. When, when, when Pastor Ad always tells us, this is the best time to live, it's because I understand the scripture. We are at the end. We are the last laborer in the last hour. Maybe the last hour is most probably the, the, the worst hour, the hardest hour, the most difficult hour. Think about it. Your last hour of work is usually not your best hour of work, right? Because you can't wait to go home. You're tired now. But if you can use this last hour and you put everything into it, then you get the reward that somebody else had to work a whole day for. Hallelujah. Let's close our eyes. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for a message that challenges us, Lord. Thank you, Father, that we have the privilege to walk into this harvest event, Lord Jesus. Father, it's been a desire for years. People have prepared for this through prayer. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that many people sitting in this place, that as their minds are shifted, Lord Jesus, and as their minds are renewed and transformed, Lord Jesus, I pray that they will see the harvests of others that they have to enter into, that they will see that they have to labor in that company, that they have to labor in that business, labor, Lord Jesus, at that specific place, Lord Jesus, so that they can reap the harvest that others have paid their lives for. Thank you, Jesus, that in our, our era, we don't just have to get wages, but we get the harvest, Lord. Father, we want to, are excited to see the greatest end-time harvest of this world ever. And Lord Jesus, let us be committed. Let us not be weary. Let us not be lazy. Let us not just say, well, it's still four months. No, the harvest is ripe. We choose to be laborers. Today, we put up our hands and we say, here I am, Lord. Use me for this harvest. Use me, oh God, use me. Because those that are willing and available, willing and obedient, will eat the good of this harvest. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you renew our minds and that you set our hearts on track. Lord Jesus, today I ask you for every unsaved soul in this place. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, knock on the door of their heart until they open up, Lord Jesus. While every head is bowed, every eye closed, maybe you have come to this place today and your life is not right with God. As you are sitting there, you say, Pastor, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Jesus is not a religion. He's a person. He's a relationship. He's a person that you can know, that you can speak to who speaks back. He's not just an ancient old God sitting on the throne somewhere. No. Jesus is alive. And Jesus paid the price for your sin. He laid down his life so that you don't have to be bound by sin. So whatever is bounding you, whatever is holding you back, Jesus has come to break those chains. And this morning I want to ask you, if you're sitting in this place and you, you know I'm talking to you, you know your life is not right with God. You know that you've never given your life to Jesus. You know that you have backslidden. And today you know you've got to come back to Jesus. Then this morning I would love to pray with you. So I'm asking every person, forget about the person next to you. This is between you and Jesus. And today, he's using my voice to call out to you and say, my son, my daughter, come home. Come back. Come home. Come home. Come home. And I'm calling you this morning. So all over this place, if that is you, you know your life is not right with God. And I would love to pray with you this morning. So I'm asking you right now, if that's you, right quickly lift up your hand now and say yes 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 this is me i want to give my life to jesus come on all over this place don't be ashamed of god don't run from god run to god he's your savior he's your healer he's your deliverer come on this morning forget about the people around you don't let anybody else put you down you know that your life is not right with god and today the holy spirit is knocking on the door of your heart and he says come 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 let me in let me in let me in this morning please open up your heart right there online in the other locations if that's you quickly just lift up your hand right now say yes yes thank you thank you thank you come on there are many more i know your life is not right with god come on lift up your hand and say yes 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 to jesus yes to jesus come on i know that the holy spirit is speaking to you the holy spirit is knocking on your door please don't turn away and walk away today come to jesus the bible says i beseech you brethren I plead with you on behalf of Christ that you surrender your life to Jesus, that you reconcile with God 
I'm asking you today, don't leave this place without surrendering your life to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Once you raise your hand, you can put it down. I'm going to ask the whole family, all of us, we're going to stand up. And then your love and your encouragement for your friends. You maybe brought somebody here. But your love and encouragement for that friend can bring them to Jesus. So I'm asking you all over this place, if that's you, you raised your hand, you did not raise your hand, but you know that you need to get your life right with God, then I would like you to come to the front right now, please. Come on, right now, as we sing this song, just leave your seat, take your personal belongings, and just come right now, and come surrender your life to Jesus. Come on. come Just turn to the person next to you, look in their eyes with love and ask them, is you okay? Are you okay? And if they don't look okay, bring them. Because today is the day of salvation. Come on, look at them, look at them, look at them. Say, hey, hey. But take care of iemand you net in the eye and you say, hey. Amen. And if they need to come, bring them, bring them, bring them, bring them. Amen. It's such a privilege to pray with you this morning. Come on, let's give the man. Family, let me explain something to you because sometimes people think we are after the numbers when it comes to mega events like this. Well, the reality is, yes, numbers plays a role. Because that's what Standard Bank tells you when you walk in there. There's power in numbers, okay? Yes. So, yes, there's power in numbers. There's power in numbers here. There's power in numbers on the stadium. That, that's the truth. That, that is truth, but that's not the only truth. Okay? Because every individual matters. Pastor Art has, has taught us that many times. We have an expectation. We go for a great harvest. We prepare for a great harvest. But then one day he just shut us all up because everybody became competitive. Because that's what happens to us as males. We get competitive. Mine is bigger than yours. Okay? So my harvest was bigger. My altar call was bigger. And then he just shut us all up. And he says, if you do this, God will not save one soul. It's about every single soul. Every single soul. So when we celebrate 1,400 salvations, it's 1,400 individuals. It's not just a crowd of people and now we look great. No, it's individuals that matter. So every individual here today, you matter to God. And every individual that will be on that stadium matters to God. Every single one. And that's what we go after. So it's a great privilege this morning to be able to pray with you. It's a huge, huge honor. And it's, I know. Because your life is going to change. And God's going to take you on a whole nother destination. Because your whole destiny is changing today. You were destined for, for failure. Now you will be destined for greatness. Because Jesus comes and he shifts everything in one moment. So it's a great privilege for me to pray for you there online as well. Thank you this morning. Put your hand on your heart and pray this prayer with me. I can't save you because I did not die for you. But Jesus did. And I want to lead you in a prayer where you give your life to him. So pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today and I want to thank you for forgiving my sins. I confess my sin before you today. And I say, thank you, Jesus, 
that you died on that cross for all my sin. Today I choose to follow you all the days of my life. I confess, Jesus, that you rose from the dead. You are seated in heaven at the right hand of God, busy praying for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me so much and that you pray for me every day. I commit myself to you. Holy Spirit, come and fill my heart. Make me a temple of God that I can live and please you all the days of my life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, we would love to pray for you individually. And we just want to ask you to go with our leaders there. Nothing strange will happen. We're just going to pray with you because we love you. I'm going to take care of you. So please just turn to your left, my right. Follow the leaders over there. Come on, as they go, let's give them a hand this morning. They're online. Please contact us online. Make sure that you send us a message so that we can reach out to you. And the other locations, please listen to the leaders. They will be speaking to you this morning. So this morning, you can take your seat for a moment. I'm going to ask Auntie Lena to come and take up the offering. And then we have a special baby dedication this morning as well. So uh, please don't be too much of a hurry to leave. Amen. So uh, get ready. Open up your hearts. Open up your wallets. <laughs> Thank you, Lena. Please come. this morning. I hope that it will touch your hearts and that you will believe in God's scripture as I read it. Today I want to speak to you about Malachi 3.10. God says, bring the full tent into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. In Israel, the people brought their tithes of grain, olives, wine, and meat to store in the temple. These goods supported the priests and Levites, those serving God, vocationally since they did not have other jobs. The goods also met the needs of the poor in the community and thirdly these goods met the expenses of the temple, the church today. Giving has always been God's way of financing his church. God never intended for the church to be funded by bingo or raffles. He expected these people to return to support the church with part of their income. Amen. Let me take a slight detour here. The purpose of the tithe is to support God's work. But the primary purpose for the tithe is to put God first in our lives. The tithe was not a legislative uh, regulation. It was more than the Old Testament income tax. God has a special purpose in asking for the tenth. It was to teach his people to put him first. Each year, you are to set aside a tenth of all the produce grown in your fields so that you will always learn to fear the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy 14, 22, 23, God says that. When we put God first in our giving, He will be first in every area of our life. This simple truth is the heart of giving. We pay God first. Too many people reverse this process. If there's anything left, they give some to God. This was what was happening in Malachi's day. They were giving God the leftovers and as a result, robbing God. Amen? Test me in this way, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi 3.10. God challenged these people to give according to the law so that he could bless them. Do you realize that this is the only time in the Bible where God puts out that kind of challenge? Too often we get hung up on the amount and miss the promise. It's amazing to me that people who trust God for their salvation, their eternity in heaven, 
won't trust God with their finances. What is the logic in that? If we can trust God for our eternal destiny, don't you think we can trust God with our careers, our finances, and our giving? Amen. So, see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. Malachi 3.10 This is an amazing passage of scripture. In a, in a giving match, the fact remains that you and I cannot outgive God. Amen? I'm going to give you a personal testimony, a short one. While everyone was fretting about their businesses and jobs in 2020 and their income, God proved himself in the blessing out of this world to me. 2020 was the year that God opened the floodgates of heaven and poured out his blessing on me. I never lost a day's salary like many of you have. When the end of 2020 came, God blessed me with a salary increase and a bonus. God proved himself to me in 2020 that if I kept his storehouse full, always that I would never lack anything. During 2020, I still tithed and made offerings into God's kingdom. I have learned since giving my life to Jesus Christ in 1983 that I need to put God and his kingdom first in every area of my life. God's hand is bigger. His shovel is bigger. His wallet is bigger. His generosity is bigger. His love is bigger. Make a game of it. See if you can outgive God. In time, you will realize that you will always lose in Jesus' name. In the end, when we rob God, uh, when we rob from God, we are actually robbing ourselves. We are robbing ourselves from spiritual blessings of God's provision of a church that can meet the needs of others. Family, we are left with a choice. How will we treat God from today? Will we rob God by not giving our tithes or will we be, we be faithful in giving God what is His? Keep that in mind while you are giving us the a offering this morning, or you are tithing in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes. Father, I come to you right now, Father God, and I pray that you will touch every man, woman, and child sitting here, Father. And I pray, God, that as they give and their mind changes in their hearts, oh, Father, that you will bless them abundantly and overflowing, God, and they, won't, they will have so much, Father, that they won't know what to do with it, Father. I pray blessings, anointed blessings upon your church today, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you so much, Lena. You know, I, that scripture that says, let the older woman teach the younger woman. When I listen to these teachings, it's phenomenal. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We appreciate you. Come on, this is Women's Month. That's why we ask the ladies of the house to take up the offering this month. They are such a blessing. So thank you so much to all the ladies. <clears throat> so as we're taking up the offering, I'm going to ask uh, the family to get ready for our baby dedication, little Luke, today. And I will not hear this in Afrikaans say, excuse me, um, because people always ask us.